Navy Mentech uh, program in SOPR. SOPR means uh, uh, funding, funding from the Navy Mentech program and then Michigan University was uh, involved in that. Uh, and also ITI is a company located in Ohio. Ohio and Michigan is close by the neighbor state. So company and NIST and Michigan University. So it's involved in that software program. And then it goes into a civil world, right? It comes starting from a, a military program, support funding, and it goes to the commerce, department of commerce, and it's going into analytics. So you get it history. So testing interoperability, you should have an interaction with other products. The same. So it's a, there are so many uh, types of testing. Very, very complicated. But anyway, we are focusing on conformance testing and interoperability mm -hmm. testing. So, I mean, the cover of them, but there are yes or not, or pass or fail testing, but also there is a uh, grade, number of grades, say, values, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, Continuous, continuous, valuable numbers, or is yes or no? Yes or no is just a digital, okay? two, two types only, yes or no, right? So this is continuous value. So anyway, this is type of uh, uh, testing, but it is something like uh, we're building the product right, we say the good or right way or right product. So it can be in the cover. Detail. Two key uh, type of testing is conformance testing and interoperability testing. So there is a test data, there is a testing tools, there is a grid uh, criteria, and the final report. Then there is test laboratory, the organization, separate organization they are doing. Uh, and then there's, we are testing what? Testing the exchange software. Step standard exchange software. So software is a test uh, target, and then the organization is doing a separate organization, not, not developer. So there is a software, there is a test data, and there is a testing tool, probably uh, uh, another software, and then criteria comes from the standard. And then report should be yes or no, and also continuous way. So it provides a high level of confidence on whether this is guaranteed. But now, interoperability is starting from system A and system B and going again, probably backwards, to us once again. So interoperability is between two systems, okay? or many systems. So there is a test data, and then the output from the A so probably this one should be step standard uh, physical file, and then finally arrive at test system B and then test B. This is a real uh, requirement coming from a real industry, right? To probably right? we are finding target. So, so we should be working together. Two different systems. And then also again, the interoperability and conformance testing. So then we finally see that there is a number of product and what is the direct uh, testing between and then M squared, something like the 15 pairs or if you have a pair this thousand pairs, then it's too much. And conformance testing is just uh, product and test case. But whether this is requirement is met, or in comparison or tabulized something like this. So conformance testing here and interoperability testing here, they are different. Right? So and also number of testing is N squared or not. You can see that uh, uh, validate on the implementation, software implementation again, explicit requirements of the standard, written inside a uh, standard. That's conformance test. But this is a user review. The real situation in the industry, we need to have an interoperability. But uh, 
the, for the official way, we are legal for what? So, test against uh, trusted reference system and then identify the interoperability issues within the course going on, right? Within the scope of the standard, according to the standard. But outside of scope of standard, there is something outside of the scope of standard that is working on interoperability. Right? And then, in, and there is an identify uh, uh, fault and broad coverage of standard and also the formality term. So inside of uh, step 80, this is a very uh, standard uh, contents of the uh, step 80. Well, among them, you should see that the uh, conformance requirement by AIT, uh, CIC. Or ATC subject. So inside uh, AP, AP because AP is the only implementable part of the step standard. The others are supporting part. Okay? So AP is the only uh, targeting for industry and the implementable and usable part. So that conformance testing and, and interoperability is important for the AP. So they should AP should define the conformance requirement inside uh, AP. So we call this is a conformance class. And then the set, as a separate part was uh, 300 uh, series because the AP is a 200 series. Uh, 300 series corresponding to the same number. A AP is what is 300 or 200 say. 214 has 314 as corresponding part that is uh, classified. So ATC is usually made of uh, each conformance requirement corresponding to one or more ATC satisfy a tested purpose. So test purpose is important keyword there, which provide a coverage of the AP. And then there is also criteria should be given. It is pass or fail, or should be higher than say 60 or 70 number in continuous value. Right. So test case one of the sample test case is uh, AP 203. It's a test case for devolved object with void. So test summary is a report. So test summary, if the specification. Criteria and then and very good criteria one two three is divided. And one uh, real world work is there is a, a implemented forum so that they have a real real testing round. Every year they have a two testing a cycle of they invite vendors software vendors. This is performed by uh, Prostec. I cannot see any Prostec. Here is a Prostec. They are joint work with the home, home page is managed by Prostec of Germany. PDS is United States, a joint work. Anyway, so they have a, a partic participating vendors list. And then there is a calendar and then there is a joint testing information for test round. Each time they have a serial number of testing rounds and recording is practice and something like that. And this is a model to be tested in current round and current test for this year. So you can find more information on this in terms of this forum. Okay. Moving to
that translate quality by breathing type one. So uh, semantic PMI, PMI means product manufacturing information, something like the tolerance and, and dimension. So, something like this one is what we call the PMI. In test cycle of this time, PMI was a most important part they were test. And also tessellation, tessellation is for uh, used for finite element analysis or sometimes it is used for 3D printing, right? So mm -hmm. And geometric validation is coming with the tolerancing and something like that. So tolerance, tesselation and production uh, and manufacturing information PMI was the topic at the time of uh, test. And this is a summary, so you can see that 34 was the biggest one, so it is two years ago. Okay. So you can see that for a long time, every year, they have a winter test ready and winter summer test ready. And you can find all the case data here and schedule, and, and you can see inside that you can find the, the uh, participating vendors, the company, the software. <coughs> oh, here is some uh, list of uh, uh, overview about vendors they, who participate in tech science since 1990. 1999. Uh, currently, the Prostel, Waterman, <coughs> uh, PTC is for now uh, moved to. Uh, and Bentley, and Siemens, PLM, Steffel, Dassault, Ecocartia, and uh, you know, IKI okay, was, it was in Ohio, Ohio. A software company, similar to Serum is from uh, UK, and then LK Software from uh, Germany, Uh, specialized for software exchange software. There is no finite element in this, right? Only CAD. Uh, nowadays, CAD software companies are bigger, so they merge the uh, engineering software the analysis tools. So the testing is done on the analysis tools? Oh, okay. There is a variation of the CATs. So CAD, CAM, and CAE. There are divisions, so, so you can, it is increased, so you, you can find it. But mainly they start from, yeah. now it's increased here then. So, uh, so T C is part is a methodology. So C is part is components testing and methodology and framework. They specify requirement and guide guideline and procedure how they do compost test. So it is a uh, simple that the overview of the compost assessment process. This is an IDF zero uh, diagram, right? So that you can see the preparation and undertaking and the execution and doing and the analysis of the results. And then report, right? This is the baseline. And then if you click on this, then you can find another slide that they show the more details of this activity. Two is this, this is so behind that you can have a more detailed one. So everything is something like that. And then you can see that abstract test sheet and then executable test sheet and outcome conform flow and verification. Okay, I guess this is done for today. Any question? Then we can switch to more. So, today I'm going to discuss the rest of the chapter. And I, I found it hard to relate section 8.5 onwards without putting some sections from the previous section. So you'll find some 
uh, familiar parts from the professor's slide here. So first, I just wanted to summarize sort of requirements, and they're divided into individual requirements, obviously. Some of these requirements are clustered together in something called conformance class. And you can have like multiple requirements in the class, or, um, yeah, like two or three or whatever you want. And then each requirement is in something called test purpose. So it's a very specific, very detailed uh, like test item for which we have an abstract test case. So we have a test case to test one or more test purposes, which may be part of a test of our conformance requirement, or maybe like even multiple uh, test purposes with multiple conformance requirements. And all of these test cases are grouped in this uh, abstract test suite. So this is kind of the overview that I managed to get. And uh, yeah, the professor said conformance testing is only to provide a level of confidence, but it does not actually guarantee that two systems may interchange data. So, uh, like just like we're doing the cat the uh, project, for example, if we're doing a translator for FreeCAD, there's another translator for SolidWorks. It doesn't mean that the preprocessor of FreeCAD is compatible with the postprocessor of SolidWorks. So, conformance is something, and interoperability is something else. Uh, yeah, it's just an idea there. And again, as I mentioned, the conformance requirements are grouped into structures for conformance classes. And each conformance class uh, must be fully supported by an AD. So when the vendor claims conformance, he claims conformance to a whole class. He cannot claim conformance to a certain requirement. He has to choose the classes for which, uh, which the uh, application conforms. So he cannot choose, he cannot only support some set of the CC and then uh, claim conformance. That's what it was. Uh, each AP is associated with an abstract test suite, as we saw in the uh, diagram. Each test case provides an implementation of the vendor's specification of the actions required to evaluate the test purposes, which may be part of one or more conformance requirements. Um, yeah, so for each test case, we have a certain number of criteria. Uh, so this case can test multiple test purposes, and if there's it's successful, then you move to the next test case and so on. And when all the test cases covering the conformance class are uh, successful, or they are passed, if you have a passing result, then that means the, uh, the vendor or the application or the implementation conforms to the standard. Again, this is the slide uh, or the example the professor gave, and just in his paperwork. Um, So this is all the uh, parts of step which define the standard of how to test for conformance. So conformance testing is actually part of step. And there's a lot of detailed procedures and like concepts and um, like what, what exactly needs to be done, basically. And some database and conventions here. And all of these are part of the uh, step standard. As you can see, we can all go to this for more detail. The conformance assessment process is actually pretty straightforward. You, know, you just prepare for testing, you do the test, analyze results, and produce report. But there's a lot of kind of internal, you know, like you need to always analyze. It's always better to analyze here than analyze here. And there's some metrics that you can measure from each step. And then uh, like if you have different parts which you need to test. It, this, this can get very complicated. It looks simple, but it's actually very complicated because there's so many things to test. And uh, the error can come from any direction. So you need to be careful while you're testing what the metrics mean. So that's why there's a very detailed standard that uh, Steph has made to, to make sure that the procedure is as standardized as possible. And there's room for a little room for error. So the 
test system, uh, like to make a test, first the people make a test system. And uh, they say the test system itself is not standardized, but it has to be based on the requirements in step, the parts that I just showed. So like you take guidance from these parts, and then you make the test system, which includes the ATS, and the ATCs, and uh, the procedure, and everything. So just an idea there. Um, the next section will be about the implementation and analysis. So first, let's understand what the word implementation means. So we have the application which uh, modifies the data, right? Let's say SolidWorks. We have a, we make a CAD model and we make a certain like, data object. And the implementation is not this. It's actually what comes after that. It's the preprocessor that will take this internal model of the software and turn it into a uh, standard representation, like step file, for example. So this is an implementation. Uh, so an implementation comes after the vendor software. We have the vendor software, and then the, the preprocessor implementation, and then the postprocessor implementation, and then either the same vendor software or another vendor software. So that's what the word implementation means, either preprocessor or postprocessor. Um, so yeah, an implementation is either preprocessor or postprocessor. The preprocessor will take the uh, information model from the software which uh, can be like a macro file, for example, that we're using. And it will try to change it into a step file, an exchange file, or it will try to, uh, like there's, a, there's two different ways to uh, translate or to kind of, to translate the file, to make a preprocessor. One will give you an output that is an exchange, an exchange file, and the other one will give you an output that is just a, like a series of codes in the database. So I didn't quite understand the database concept, but, uh, the way I understand it is that a database will hold all the semantics of your AP. So all the data objects will be properly linked, and you just need to input your model into the database using the proper functions that are given to you. So you can, you're only allowed to make a circle, uh, and then make a line, and then make a sketch, and so on. So there's very limited number of, of up, like instructions or functions that you can use, and these calls uh, can be like the output form of your preprocessor. Mm -hmm. I hope that was somewhat clear. Right? For more details, you can always visit my video in this chapter. Okay, so to do testing, we have something called implementation under test, or IET, for short. And the idea is that the information must be translated from the starting point to the ending point while preserving the semantics. So, actually, this is not very clear unless you take an example. So, I tried to make this hypothetical example using our product as a reference. So imagine that we have an AP for macroparametrics approach. So the macroparametrics approach is actually an AP. And we are trying to make the implementation for preprocessor and postprocessor to make a transcan macro file, which is like uh, an instance of an AP express file. Now this is not true, this is like, it's actually an XML file. But let's assume that, just to understand what the, um, how the analysis and how the implementation works. So the transcatter macro file will be like an exchange file, like a step file, but for features. So we have lines, circles, sketches, and extrudes, and so on. And uh, our implementation, like let's say we're making a preprocessor to take a free cast macro file, this will be the input, and output this standard exchange file, which is a transcatter macro file. Again, this is all hypothetical because I, like, I don't think there's an AP for the MPA, macro parameters approach, but if there is one, and if we can imagine this, then it becomes easier to understand. So another implementation will be the post-processor, and we'll take in the uh, standard exchange file, and it will output any other uh, macro file for any other software. So this is the idea of pre-processor, standard exchange file, and then post-processor. And the idea is that the, out the input and the output should be the same. So if you open the macro file in free it should give you the model, and if you open the output macro file also in FreeCAD, it should give you the same model, for example. So just keep this example in mind, and I'm going to refer back to it again and again. So uh, the input provides the information which is represented in the data format and the operating system. This is not standardized. Like the, uh, the syntax is not standard. It can be anything. It can be a text file, uh, just like using language, like make an extrude of this depth or something. So the syntax is not standard, but the semantics should be the AP semantics because this is exactly like, if it fits the format, then it must use the same semantics. So in this case, you can assume this is like a free cat macro file. 
you know, it's not like standard, but it's uh, it gives us all the meanings, all the, the knowledge that we need, all the information that we need. And this input will be a subset of the information requirements of the AP, obviously. Um, because we're trying to test and train components, it has to be uh, following the requirements. In case the semantic requirements, the syntax is, is obviously not the same. So the semantics are well defined in that, but the syntax is not. Like for example, we can have extrude versus app. You know, these are two different syntax, but they refer to the same thing practically, so it's fine. Uh, for performance testing purposes, uh, the format has been defined as a human readable text. But the input must be readable by you because then you can maybe uh, like program, make some program to read it also. If you can read it and understand, you can also make a program to read it properly. Uh, the action of the translation produces an, an, insta an instance of the express game schema. This is just like a step file, just like the one we did for your homework. Do we even have an example here? Yeah, something like this. This will be an instance file, um, which is, this is the standard exchange format, basically. This will be a standard exchange file, then it comes from an input and it goes to an output. So, uh, this pretty much summarizes what I wanted to say. Post processor, just the opposite. We take the standard exchange file and we try to make a certain uh, file that again holds all the semantics, but is not uh, like does not have any specified or specified syntax in, in step. Step does not impose any specific syntax. But you can think of it as the also output macro file of like uh, the post processor in our project, for example. Uh, okay, so to test an implementation, let's say we have a preprocessor, we have a postprocessor. How can we make sure that this actually conforms to our standard? So we have three things to check. First is the syntax of the. Uh, let's just go through. So the syntax and structure applies to the preprocessing testing. So we have the exchange file here. This should follow very specific syntax, like all the hashes, all the numbers, and so on. So we have to check the syntax. Another important thing is the structure, which is basically telling us that uh, we have the right types. So these types here were defined in the schema of the AP. So if we're using some weird types which were not defined in the AP schema or in the, uh, in the AIM Express schema, then this is a uh, like non-conformant structure. So structure will check the type um, and the constraints, mainly. And then semantics basically compares the semantic of the input and the output. And also the intermediate file. So the, the semantics of the exchange and the input file, the output file should all be the same. Otherwise, then the translation kind of distorted the meaning. So these are the three kind of things. Syntax to input and uh, uh, syntax to make sure all the, the you know, formal language details are followed, like the semicolon, the hash, the number, and so on. Structure to make sure we're using the schema. We're not using any other schema. We're using certain AP schema. And semantics to make sure that we're actually doing the translation right. You know, to compare the meaning of all the models at, at every stage and see that they are the same. Um, yeah, so that's just what I'm saying. Checks of the file is truly an instance of the AP scheme or not. This is structure analysis. And semantic analysis compares inputs and outputs and, and make sure that they're referring to the same thing. And that's pretty much it. Syntax, structure, semantics. These are three main uh, analysis or the three main tasks for analysis that we need to do. So that was about performance testing. Um, now, interoperability testing is very similar, but it's also slightly different. So let me skip to this. So this is uh, this is from the book and from the professor's slide, and this is just back to the hypothetical example that we did from our product slide. So with the performance testing, we have one system and one implementation, and we're doing the preprocessor and then the postprocessor post-processor back to the same system. With the interoperability testing, we have the pre-processor going to a standard exchange file from one system, and then the post-processor from another system. So we have two systems that we're trying to make sure the uh, data can transfer properly between them. Going to this project again, the, uh, the concept of, of, of the performance testing would be to try to make the pre-processor and then the post-processor Using the same software, so we have FreeCAD, FreeCAD. We're not, we're not changing the software, but going from FreeCAD to TransCAD to Pro Engineer and then back. This is, um, this is interoperability here. So that's the difference between these two. Yeah, this is what the book actually showed. 
applications of planning and testing. Uh, we have to have, and, and this is especially for interoperability testing, uh, we have to have these elements here, something called exchange scenario, uh, which is basically what we're trying to test. So all the test purposes, uh, all the conformance classes that we need to test, and to have like them listed down and everything very specifically. And we have to have some measures to measure how successful our test was or how successful the exchange was. I'm going to go through, through this one by one, so go ahead. So the scenario is we define the scope of the test, so the test purpose, when it's being tested. And uh, this is just kind of a workflow here um, for the test that can describe a certain scenario. So the idea is to know exactly when you're testing, which makes sense. This, is, this should be the starting point. And then to uh, make a proper test, you need to be able to identify if this test was a pass or a fail. You need some measure, you need some number to tell you how, how good or bad the translation was. So um, these can be used to check for errors and to provide some information to, for debugging and to uh, make the verdict to make sure that, or to tell whether this test was passed or failed. There's two fundamental types of metrics. One is simple, the other is process. The idea is like it's, the difference is simple. Simple metrics are based on instance. So we take the, uh, like you take the model, for example, here, and you take the metric, like the surface area or the mass or the, uh, the center of mass or something. This would be a simple metric. It's at a certain point. Process metric is comparing two simple metrics. You have a simple metric here, a simple metric here, and then we're comparing the two. So that's a process metric. And, uh, yeah, so process metrics are metrics that are not computed directly from the model, but are determined by comparing some simple metrics of the model to different states. So we have different states and we're comparing the metrics. Uh, the rest is pretty much straightforward. So example of metrics, we can have the file size. Yeah, the two kind of are, are equivalent, the semantics are equivalent. The file size should be pretty much similar. It should not work so much. Translation time, maybe the system area that there is some Errors in the action in the software gives you an error. Maybe that's a bad sign, typically. Uh, surface area, volume, mass properties, all of these should be more or less equivalent if you want to. You know, they don't give you any, like, I mean, you have to prove whether or not they guarantee that the two models are the same. Just because they have the same center of mass does not necessarily mean the two are the same. But, you know, if all of these are identical, then chances are two models are the same. And you can always see them and check them visually. So, Exchange procedures and controls. Uh, again, as I said, this can be very complicated because we have too many test purposes, we have too many test cases, and often this is done by many people at the same time. So it's collaborative work. And to manage such a scale of work, it can be very tedious and we need to record so many metrics. And uh, making detailed procedure and you know, like error detection methods, which are like the controls or the procedure to detect errors and how to infer errors from the metrics and so on. This is very important. So again, these two are very important elements of your plan, of your test plan. So finally, once you have your test measures, you can do some uh, result check. And there's a number of software tools provided by the test community for uh, analysis. One is called Step File Checker. And it takes in the step exchange file, which is like, just like the homework example. And it will check the syntax and the structure. So it will compare it to the schema and see if this is really uh, like a proper syntax and if it's uh, taken from the schema or not, or if it follows the rules of the schema or not. Uh, so it ensures all the rules are maintained and so on. So this is uh, one tool we can use. Geometry Analyzer will give you all the geometric uh, properties and metrics of your model, and you can compare the two uh, geometry, the, the geometric portion of the step file. So you cannot compare any other feature like colors and other like uh, annotations and so on, but at least you can compare them to uh, There's also this kind of uh, sophisticated tool. It's called ARM, or like ARM is the uh, application reference model and application interpreted model, browser editor. So this one is more of a visualization tool. It can, uh, it's like both translation and visualization. It can go from an AIM instance to an ARM instance, sorry. So it provides this way to uh, be able to visualize or view uh, your, your models at different stages of the exchange process. Again, it wasn't very clear to me. It was only described very briefly in the book, so I uh, cannot give you much detail on this. 
other testing tools which are often very useful uh, are least. Um, this is more of a process, like this, almost the same process that we showed before, but it's using all the tools now. So we have the IC script, which you can think of it as a macro browser, for example. And we have the first day two preprocessor, and then we have the exchange file. We can do this coverage analyzer. It checks how much, uh, what parts of the specification are covered. So maybe not all the AP is being covered by this file, only a certain portion of it. So it gives you the percentage of the uh, uh, coverage. And uh, there's a test purpose generator. It takes the uh, schema and it takes like your, your somehow generates the test purposes that you need to generate. I'm not sure of the details, but you can read more about it. And this kind of uh, right again, we need to do syntax analysis, and structure analysis of the exchange file, and at the end we need to do semantic analysis to compare the output. So we have the output here coming in, and we have the input coming from the beginning. We have to compare the semantics of the two and make sure that the semantics need to be uh, the semantics are equivalent. So it's a pretty complicated process, but uh, this is just a brief idea. Now, certification is another sort of complicated process because we have different stakeholders that play roles. So we have the user, and we have the vendor, and we have these uh, organizations, government organizations, and then we have people actually doing the work, like people doing testing and people giving the certificate. So just briefly, uh, the idea that is that the vendor will make tests and it will give, it, give it to the lab laboratory. The laboratory will give the test results. If the test results are passed or positive, then we go to a certain submit this to the certification body and they get certified. Otherwise, there will be some disputes or issues, so this can always be, this cycle can be taken as many times as necessary until positive test results are given. And then certification is uh, provided. And these two bodies are uh, approved or accredited by these government organizations. So they just say they're doing a good job, and these actually do the job. These two. And these are the vendors and users. So this gives you an overview. I'm pretty sure it's much more complicated than this, but uh, just to have an idea. Pros and cons of testing. Um, obviously, there's a lot more pros and cons. But uh, the idea is we can detect errors easily. We can make a test case like optimized test cases. Uh, so this is like, uh, I'm not sure if this should be a tool or not, but it's, uh, it's more like, like we have certain, like for, for the same or for similar applications, we can use the same test cases. So for similar implementation, we can always use the same test cases. So as time goes by, we have better and better test cases, which more, uh, like are more straightforward and give you exactly what you need to know. So optimized test cases, uh, this is an outcome. Uh, Again, okay, like initial confidence is probably the most important one, but it gives you uh, an idea that this application is like uh, probably going to interoperate, probably. But again, conformance testing does not guarantee this. It just gives you an idea that maybe this will interoperate in the future. The main con is it adds time and cost because there's so many things to be done. Input data, develop the testing tools, run the test, analyze the results. All of this takes time and money, and uh, that's obviously a con. So my two references, the book and the presentation for our product, just for the diagrams, and the hypothetical example. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Or criticism? <laughs> Too much yeah. text. Anything wrong I said? What? Too much text. Yeah, I realized that. <laughs> I tried to include all the details. So did you get anything at all? <laughs> no? Questions? Thank you. That's it? Thank you. Okay, let's go. Uh, discussion now. So today I've prepared many topics. So open source and open standard. So many people who are uh, not in the software industry sometimes they, uh, feel very confused about the term open standard and open source. 
So today we are going to like, figure out the similarity and even the differences. and also differences. So how do you think about the open source and open standards? Okay, maybe this can a little bit about the first. Okay, okay, maybe you can uh key and Muhammad will be open source and the art up to will be open standards. Then we can swipe uh, laws. What is open standards? Well, just like uh, now, we are going to figure out the uh, open, open standards. Mm -hmm. Because uh, some people have just feel so, just so confused about the terms like open standards and open source. Okay, so Is there any closed standard? Closed standard? Not open the standard. Every standard should be open. Right? Yeah, but uh, for for free? Yeah, maybe, maybe so some standards uh, uh, maybe it's just within one company. It's only inside one company. Sure, if I get your point here, so I guess. Could it be that you mean you know, like, uh, open source means sharing the source file, the source code, and open standards means multiple like vendors, maybe, but mm -hmm. they, um, they just share data. They don't share the process, they just share the data. Is that what you mean? No? I think, like, for, for open standards, I mean, for this term, it's like a very, it has a very broad uh, like definition, so. We can just like uh, give a it's more like open source versus closed source and just sharing data. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we don't need to like figure out how it can be interpreted in which company or even with which field. It's quite a broad definition. Open source is more efficient because um, like everyone is just sharing, like programming a certain implementation or a certain software once, and then it's open for everyone to use. There is no need to do interchange in the first place. So you can just add to the same software, and it becomes public to use for everyone. So it's more like a standard process. And if the process is standard, then you don't need to exchange like data. <coughs> you just you know, use the data, the data model of this process or of this software. So there's less redundancy. There's no need for multiple, you know, vendors or multiple um, and ways like brands doing the same thing. And then you decide that you also need to do the interoperability and the testing and the standards. 
all of this is just too much money and too much effort. So just share the source code. Anyone can use it. Bring it the way they want. Just back up in line with my footprint, and you can just from the open source, back up, open source side, and you can just back up to back up. Mm, to make some differences, and you know, so what's the difference between the two? And what's the line between the two? Mm. Escape from the slide show. Sometimes 
Two are at the different levels open standard and open source. And based upon the open standard, developers can make their source and make it open source. And the, <coughs> the structure of the open source uh, can be different. Based uh, from from developer to developer, so it's different levels. So it's hard to say which is better. Or yes, uh, we're not uh, trying to which side I say which is better. Go just like generally, uh, different differences. Yeah, because uh, sometimes um, many people uh, just feel so confused. Similarities maybe uh, as it as it showed open standard is require open standard require no license fee mm -hmm. and so does open source right mm -hmm. so that can be similarity okay what was different. Uh, even though it's an open standard, you cannot modify it freely and make a new standard easily. Okay. Uh, uh, whereas with the uh, open source, you can create a new source, your source, based on the open source that you adopted. And you can make it another open source. That can be different. Okay. I agree with you. <laughs> we all agree. <laughs> Any more ideas? Standard and data standard, like for example, like for the like browsers, explore and cloud and type of web browsers, and also like for cat cat of the technology, cloud operating software engineering and software, like for the global standards. So um, we are going to like uh, try to find the similarities and the differences. is composed of data and which function? Or yes, right? yes, sometimes it's data. No. But like a software is not equal to data, right? Hmm? So software is different from data, right? No, software contains data. Yes, yes. yes sometimes it contains, sometimes it, it, it might not be, it might not contain data. Not always. Data. Not always. Uh, of your yeah. process data. Yeah, process data is not equal to data. If you want to develop a software, yeah. you will need a data structure and also process yeah. and so on. Mm -hmm. So not only just data is required, also other things yeah. will be needed. Yeah. And we don't... Well, like also here we're, we focus on the standard, not for the software element of this data. Do you know any software that is a standard? 
Have you heard or do you know any standard that is so fair or vice versa? Mm. If you can find the most any prophecy site. That this is exactly the yes. <coughs> site. Yes, for even for the software, like uh, when we are making the kind of like even the CAD software, like RPG, there must be a standard for this. Uh, they are not standard, but so called de facto so standard for software, CAD software. But it's not exactly the standard. It's just used as used widely so that we call it as a standard. Uh, that's my understanding. Okay. We don't call Microsoft Word as a standard, but we regard it as a standard document process. So you mean there there's no standard at all? Uh, in terms of software we can think of it as a standard because everyone uses it but that is not exactly the documented standard so like ISO 10303 that okay. so because if you want if you need to develop the software there must be ton tons of so-called standard will be needed. Data standard, what I mean by. So it is hard to find a, a software standard on the global scale, but we can find some local scale software standards such as uh, in inside companies. Software versus using multiple software that agree to standard between them for exchange. Okay. From the user's point of view, uh, for example, some your Samsung employee and Samsung forces to use Alejandro software, then uh, if it's functionally the same, uh, you you don't care about the inside the software itself. If it's the if functions are the same, but in terms of data standard, from the developer's point of view, it's, uh, things are things will change if the data standard they are using is different. It's a different point of view, but uh, it's hard to debate. Unless you're just working inside the company, you don't need to share any information, then software standard will be a thing. But even for like word processing, if you want to show the file to someone outside the company, you still have to use like T like for example, which may be considered another software standard or like certain I think it's a standard, I'm not sure, PDF version. So you still have to use some data standard to share with other people. Unless like everyone just lives inside the company and no one needs to have access to this information. You don't need the data standard. You can just use the software interface to use it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, 
consciousness. Like that. Sometimes we regard the software standard as a basic kind of feeling. We just think of those two are equivalent. For example, use Satya, then we we will assume that you can give me Katya data data as a standard UG data because the proprietary standard uh, proprietary software will provide you the data standard of the software Katya will provide you Katya data format Some never can think of those two as the equivalent. So if you think of software and data, then it, it will be different. Thank you. 